to turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. As we've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount, that's Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. This is when Jesus took a uh, break, you might say, from he uh, healing multitudes of people. It said people who were afflicted with various diseases, who were demon-possessed, who were disabled in various ways. And he goes up in this hillside that overlooks the Sea of Galilee. And from that, uh, he gives us this amazing message that outlines for us the characteristics of how his disciples should live. Uh, these are like principles for the kingdom of God. This is not how you get saved, by the way. This is just the ideal. This is how we should live. And you can't do this without Jesus, obviously. We saw in chapter 5, uh, Jesus gives us the proper way to understand the law of God. He gives us the, pro the proper interpretation of the law. He was very clear that the law cannot make a person righteous, but the law is only given to show us how unrighteous we all are. Nobody can keep the law. It's perfect and we're not. Chapter 6, Jesus taught us the proper way to pray, the proper way to give, the proper way uh, to serve. It's not by drawing attention to ourselves, but it's by pointing people to Jesus. It's to do all things quietly with a thankful heart, because it is all about Jesus. It's not about us. As we come into chapter 7, this final chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, the theme of this section is judgment. And Jesus will speak of a few different ways of judging. Um, there are many different Greek words for judge or judging in the New Testament. There's four primary words that are used. Krino, K-R-I-N-O, uh, just is the main one. Jesus will use that word here in verse 1 in a moment. There's katakrino, which is just a hyper uh, word concerning krino. There's diakrino and there is anacrino. Those are the four primary words that are all translated judging and we'll look into those a little bit later on uh, th this morning. So, the Pharisees, as we've seen, were notorious for judging people. Uh, they looked down their noses at everybody. And, and as we'll see, their motives were wrong. Oftentimes their motives were just wicked. Uh, their assessment of a situation, because that's how you judge, you assess something and then you add it up, and then the way they assess things, it was always wrong. Their, their judgment was way off, but as we'll also see, there are times that we are supposed to judge. And this is the area where Satan loves to confuse us. He tries to get us to think, oh, you can't judge any situation or any person uh, you, you're going against what God's Word says, but oftentimes we judge when we're not supposed to judge, but then we don't judge when we are supposed to judge. And so we'll look at that, why this is so important, and, and we'll look at these things and see how Jesus um, you know, applies this to our lives. So, chapter 7, verse 1. Very famous verse, "...judge not that you be not judged." I can guarantee almost everybody in the United States knows this verse, especially unbelievers. Don't judge me, man. Jesus said, judge not. And it's usually said by those who are living in sin and rebellion against God. So here Jesus uses the word krino for judge. It simply means to condemn someone. This is the type of judgment we are not to be involved with. We cannot condemn people. In other words, Jesus is warning us not to censor the kingdom of God. Or to say it another way, it's not our job to determine who's worthy to go to heaven and who's worthy to go to hell or who's not worthy to go to heaven. Uh, only Jesus can wash away our sins. Only Jesus can save us. Only He is righteous. We are all deemed unworthy of heaven because the Bible is clear. There's none righteous, no, not one. Not one of us in here, apart from Christ. We've all sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. And so nobody is worthy of heaven, but Jesus, when He comes into our lives and saves us and washes all of our sins away, He gives us His very own righteousness, and now you are worthy of heaven. It's not because of you, it's because of Jesus in you. 
So it's not our job to look at people and say, well, God can't save somebody like you. He doesn't want your kind, whatever that means. He doesn't want your kind in heaven. That, that's a lie from the pit. If that was the case, none of us would go to heaven. But that's exactly what the Pharisees were doing in Jesus' day. They would look at people uh, they considered to be misfits, low life, not worthy of heaven, and they would condemn them. In other words, they would look at people and they would like, I'm not going to tell that person that they can go to heaven. God wouldn't accept them because I don't accept them. And if I don't accept them, then surely God won't accept them. So they gave them no chance nor give them any hope that God loved them. They gave them no hope that God was a God of grace and mercy and forgiveness. These same Pharisees are the ones that get on Jesus' case because he hung around sinners and tax collectors. Don't you know what you're doing? And they were upset with him. But again, that's the whole reason why Jesus came from heaven to earth. Uh, a few simple verses that clarify this. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Jesus says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So the potential is for anybody to get saved if they'll come to Christ for salvation. He came to die on the cross for all of us. Jesus will tell the Pharisees in Matthew 9, verse 13, But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I don't care about all your rules and rituals and regulations that you've added to God's word. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Again, who's righteous? Nobody. But the Pharisees thought they were, so they were self-righteous. So he's giving them a little dig. I didn't come to call you guys because you guys think you're righteous, but you're not. But I came to you know, bring salvation to sinners. I want to see sinners repent. That's all of us. In John 7, 24, Jesus is answering his critics. And these are those who are claiming Jesus has a demon. Can you imagine saying, Jesus, you have a demon? Are you nuts? Because he healed a man on the Sabbath. So he says to them, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. And he uses the word carino there. So he's telling them that their assessment of the entire situation is way off base. They're totally wrong. And we can often make the same mistake when we start judging others with the judgment that is reserved only for Jesus. You know, Jesus has all authority to judge Crino, not us. Right, we'll see what, how we're supposed to judge in, in, in a moment. But John chapter 5, verse 22, Jesus says, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. And so who can come into God's kingdom is not for any of us to decide. In fact, I would much rather have someone in here who has all, you know, tattoos all over their body. They got a, you know, purple pink hair. They got a nose ring. They got a well-worn Bible and they love Jesus. I'd rather have them here than somebody that's all dressed to the hilt and they look down their nose at everybody around them. Think about it. Look what Jesus says in verse 2. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. In other words, the standards you set for other people will in turn be the standards used against you. This is part of reaping what you sow. If you sow to the flesh, you reap of the flesh corruption. There's a parallel passage that Jesus expounds on this a little bit more in Luke chapter 6 verse 37. Jesus says, judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and it will be forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, here's a, a thought. Wouldn't it be great if every person that gets on Facebook and any other Internet site would read that verse before they start spewing their venom and their hatred and they start saying anything about anybody and trash people mercilessly and go away thinking, well, I got them good. They need to read that because they're going to reap what they sow. 
A day is coming when they will stand before God and give an account for all that they have done. Well, look at verse 3. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank, some say beam, in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Um, this verse has always made me smile when I read this because Jesus is using, you know, um, what, exaggerated sentence, hyperbole, something like that, where he's, he's making something like you say, man, these groceries weigh a ton. That's hyperbole. Well, that's what he's saying. you got a beam, a log coming out of your eye, and you're going to remove a speck from your brother's eye? How does that work? You know, think of going to an eye doctor. You know, hopefully he's not named Dr. Eye Plank, you know, or Plank Man. I mean, that'd be bad. You know, if you walked in there and it's like, oh, I'm Dr. Plank Man. I see you got a little speck in your eye, and here's a beam coming out of his eye, and he's trying to get your speck. I mean, you wouldn't want to go there. You go, I'll go down to, you know, the office next door. Dr. Clear Eye's down there. I think I'll go him. You know, I mean, it would be crazy. But the person with a plank in their eye refers to those who have a critical attitude, a judgmental view about everybody. And in other words, they can find fault in anybody. And I've said this for years. I can sit down with somebody for 10, 15 minutes, and I can find fault. You can do the same with me. It's not hard if that's what we're supposed to do, but that's not what we're supposed to do. Also take note of who Jesus says has a speck in their eye. Did you notice three times he says, your brother, if your brother... You know, if your brother has a speck in his eye, now most of the time we as Christians should be looking for ways to build up the body of Christ instead of looking for ways to tear it down. It's much easier to tear something apart than it is to put it back together. I remember when I was a kid, I started taking my dad's lawnmower apart, <laughs> and uh, he wasn't real happy with that. It was easy. It was fun taking it all apart, and he looked at me and said, put it back together. And I'm like, uh, I can't do that. It's easy to tear things apart. It's much difficult, more difficult to put it back together. But there are times when we are instructed to warn, we're instructed to rebuke, we're instructed to correct a sinning brother or sister in Christ, but it is wrong to constantly be looking for some little speck in somebody's eye so we can say, gotcha. And that's what a lot of people are doing. Paul says it like this in Galatians 6, verse 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. So there you're, you know, you get the speck out of your eye, then you can see clearly to get the speck out of somebody else's eye, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he, can, he deceives himself. And so the point Jesus is making here is it's wrong to be critical of others when you are blind to your own faults, when you're blind to your own failures, when you're blind to your own sins. The Pharisees, again, they're a great example of this. They kept trying to find fault in Jesus, which is impossible. I mean, he's perfect. He never sinned, never did anything wrong. He was perfect in every way, and yet they're constantly trying to find fault in him. They were blind, didn't even realize how wrong they were themselves. But once you've gotten the plank out of your own eye, that big beam coming out of your eye, how do you do that, by the way? Get the uh, beam or plank out of your eye? You confess your sin. You repent of that sin. You start walking in the power of the Holy Spirit once again, and then you can see clearly because now you're being more like Jesus. And once that plank is removed, then we can you know, help our brother, help our sister, Remove that little speck, he says, it's in their eye. Be careful. You know, we're only able to see clearly when we're walking in the Spirit, when we're extending grace and mercy and love and compassion to others. That's how Jesus deals primarily with us. The only time he needs to discipline us is when we're being stubborn, we're digging in our heels, we're saying, yeah, I know your word says this, but I'm going to do this anyway. But he still loves us if we're his child. This is what Hebrews 12, 6 tells us. 
For whom the Lord loves, he chastens or disciplines and scourges every son whom he receives. And so we need to stop judging. We need to stop condemning everybody around us. Again, only Jesus is perfect. Remember what I said earlier, though. Not all judgment is wrong. Not all judgment is bad. There are times we are told you need to have this type of judgment. Again, this is where Satan tries to mix things around. And we don't walk in discernment. We don't walk in judgment at all. But there are types of judgment that we are to examine. We're to use discernment, whether something is true or false or right or wrong. Look at verse 6. Jesus says, Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn and tear you in pieces. Now think about this. It takes discernment. It takes wisdom to make the right judgment as to whether or not a person you're dealing with is a brother or sister in Christ, whom Jesus refers to all of us as his sheep. He's a good shepherd. So are you dealing with a sheep or are you dealing with a dog or a pig? You need to judge rightly concerning these things. What is a dog? What is a pig in this context? The Bible will speak of dogs as those who are trying to put you under the law. They're the Pharisees. Paul will call them dogs. False prophets, false teachers are sometimes referred to as dogs and pigs. Not sheep. Look at 2 Peter 2, verse 22. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb. A dog returns to its own vomit. Oh, I'd love to say that just before lunch. <laughs> what does a dog do? Well, it tells you. It's disgusting. It's gross. Why? Because that's its nature. That's what dogs do. Sheep, we don't do that. You don't keep returning to the same old sin and keep going back to it. You're a new creation in Christ. A sow or pig having washed to her wallowing in the mire, the mud hole. Again, that's their nature. But as the Lord's sheep, we have a new nature, and so we follow Jesus. He's called the Good Shepherd. This is what Paul says in Philippians 3, verse 2. Beware of dogs. He's not talking about four-legged creatures here. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. Was that in reference to? Circumcision. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Jesus Christ, and have no confidence in the flesh. And so in these verses, Paul is referring to the unsaved legalistic Jews as dogs. Why? Because instead of trusting in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, these guys are saying, "You." and this is in Acts chapter 15, by the way, these guys that would go up into Galatia, and they said, you Gentiles, you can't be saved unless you're circumcised according to the law of Moses. Well, Paul said, no way. And so they go down to Jerusalem. Acts 15 is the first church council, and they have a big debate, argument about this. And Peter stands up and says, man, we're Jews, and we still sin. So what is trying to follow the law done for us? We weren't saved because of the law. We, need, we all need Jesus. That was the whole point. You're saved by Christ, faith alone in Christ alone. You can't be saved by trying to keep the law. So here Jesus says, don't give what is holy to the dogs. Don't cast your pearls before the swine. So how are you going to know not to do this? Well, you need to judge correctly. How do we judge correctly? There's only one way. It's through God's Word. You have to run everything, filter everything through the Word of God. People can say all kinds of stuff. I can say all kinds of stuff. I'm not the final authority. God's Word has to be the final authority. This is what you stand on, not what I say or anybody else out there. It's what does God's Word say. Does it line up with the whole counsel of Scripture? That's important. There's a lot of people, they'll just kind of cherry pick a few verses. They try to make a doctrine out of it. Be careful. We have a number of examples in the scriptures where we are encouraged to judge what other people say about spiritual matters. Again, the word crino means to condemn. We don't do that. That's reserved only for Jesus. But there's two words in the New Testament 
that we are encouraged to use, and that is diacrino and anacrino. Both mean to examine, to scrutinize, and discern. The difference is diacrino means you are um, basically narrowing things down. So I'll use the example of when somebody comes knocking on my door, pseudo-Christian cult, J-W-L-E-S, whatever it might be, and I've talked to many, many, many over the years. I worked with them many, for many years, and they, you know, they, they have all these things they want to talk about and all these different peripheral issues. You have to narrow it down to this. Who is Jesus Christ? That's the bottom line. Why did Jesus Christ come from heaven to earth? That's it. you got to focus on that. So diacrine means you're bringing it down, narrowing it down, finding out who is Jesus. Both those cults say, well, Jesus was a created being. J.W. say he's Michael the archangel, created being. Mormons say, well, he was born like us. He became and grew into godhood. And we can all become a god as well. Well, what does the Bible say? Well, Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God, without beginning, without end. He, he was God who became man. He didn't grow into Godhood. He's always been God. And then why did he come? Did he come to make good people like us better? No. <laughs> did he come to show us how to live? No. Jesus came expressly from heaven to earth to be the Lamb of God, to die on the cross and shed his blood for our sins. That's why he came from heaven to earth, to show us that we are not able to save ourselves. He alone paid the price in full, which was his perfect spotless blood. So we need to focus on that, bring it down to, that's diacrino, examine, scrutinize, discern these things. Here's an example of diacrino in the word. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 29, where Paul says, Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. That's diacrino. So you want to know, are they real prophets of God or are they false prophets? We're going to listen to what they say, and then we're going to discern, determine, judge what they're saying. Is it lining up with Scripture, or are they adding to the Word of God? Are they taking things out of God's Word? Are they, you know, uh, twisting the Scriptures? That's where you need diacrino. Paul tells the Thessalonian believers, 1 Thessalonians 5.21, Test all things, hold fast what is good. So if you ever hear somebody on whatever TV, Christian program, TBN or whatever, you know, this is the word of the Lord. Don't judge me, man. I'm a prophet of God. I'm the anointed one. And then they spew out something that is totally off the wall. Discern, rightly judge. That's wrong because God's word is the final authority. An example of anacrino. Anacrino is primarily used when we judge the world around us. How's it used? 1 Corinthians 2, verses 14 and 15. Paul says, But the natural man, that's the unbeliever, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. That word discerned is anacrino. But he who is spiritual judges, again, anacrino, all things, yet he himself is rightly judged, anacrino, by no one. With worldly people, you listen to what they say, and then you add up. So the other one is you shrink it down, narrow it down. This one you add up, anacrino, ana, add up, what they're saying, and then you weigh what they say against the Word of God. So they both mean to have this discernment, this wisdom. Most of the time, having weighed out what the world says, we come to the conclusion I'm going to believe my Bible. I don't care what they say. They can say the world's 10 billion years old or whatever. No, I'm going to believe what the Bible says. Uh, you know, anybody that starts off saying, well, I don't believe there's a God, and we all came from goo to you by way of the zoo, I'm not going to believe what they're going to say because they have a whole different worldview, and I judge their worldview is wrong according to the Bible. Stick with the Word of God. If you can believe Genesis 1-1, the rest is easy. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Again, the word created there is bara. In the Hebrew, it means to create something out of nothing. So where did it all start? Big Bang? Yeah, God spoke it into existence. Let there be light. Boom, there was light. 
And he just spoke the word and it came out of nothing. That's the big bang, if, you, if there is one. But it was God creating everything out of nothing. A little later in chapter 1, verse 26, the Godhead says, Okay, now let us make man after our own image, after our own likeness. So you didn't come from a monkey. You know, your monkey's uncle. No, you came from the Lord. He created you. Again, not all judgment is bad. In fact, we need God's wisdom. We need God's discernment to know what we believe and why we believe it. That comes from God's word. Again, Jesus says, watch out for dogs, watch out for pigs, because they can do a lot of damage. So Jesus wants us to be alert, on guard. Now look at verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. In the Greek, it literally means keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Very important. We talked about this a few weeks ago. It's not wrong, and it's not a lack of faith to pray and ask the Lord for something more than once. There's some word of faith teachers say, well, if you ask God for something and you have to ask Him the second time, it shows your lack of faith. That's not what the Bible says. Jesus is a great example of this. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane just before the crucifixion. He prayed three times the exact same prayer. Is that a lack of faith? No. Father, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He prayed it three times. He didn't lack faith. Same with the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He plead, it says he pleaded, it literally means he begged the Lord three times that God would remove that thorn in his side, whatever that thorn in his flesh was. And God said, no. God said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Nowhere does it say you pray more than once. It's a, it's a lack of faith. On the other hand, we saw Jesus said, don't be like those who have vain repetitions of their prayer. I mean, that would be like just praying something over and over and over and over and over again, like a you know, Hindu chant or a mantra. You just repeat the same words. Jesus said of those people, they think they'll be heard for their many words. But here Jesus is encouraging us to ask, to seek, to knock. And it boils down to coming to the Lord as one of His precious children. You come to the Lord with a sincere heart. And you know that He will hear you. Hebrews tells us that His throne room of grace is open to us all the time. And as His children, we can come with boldness. That doesn't mean arrogance. It means with confidence into the throne room of grace, where we can find help and mercy, grace in time of need. So God's timing, that's so important when it comes to praying. In God's timing, we will receive, we will find, we will discover what He has for us. And again, it takes faith, because so often I pray for something, but it's not according to His will. So he doesn't listen to me. He doesn't have to. Well, look what Jesus goes on to say here. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, well, I'm a pretty good dad. No, Jesus says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him. So in these verses, Jesus wants us to see the contrast between human fathers, even on their best day, and our Father in heaven. And what's the contrast? There is no contrast. God is God. He's perfect in every way. He loves you unconditionally. He's so much greater, infinitely more loving and giving and gracious than the best dad in the world. And if you got a t-shirt that says best dad in the world, you might be, but our Father in heaven is infinitely greater than you are. Never forget that. Anyway, realize this. Our Father, He says here, only gives us good things when we ask Him. Our view of something good and His view of something good could be 180 degrees opposite. You keep that in mind when you're praying. This is where our faith in the Lord needs to be, that when we ask something from Him, 
We need to trust Him that He knows what we need better than we do. There's been a lot of times I've asked God for something, and He gives me something different. Different, but much better. Different, but what I really needed. Uh, I think that's why some Christians get confused and maybe even a little upset with God. You know, Lord, this isn't what I asked for. Why, why don't you give me what I asked for? I can imagine God saying something like, Jeff, you keep asking me for stones, for scorpions, for serpents. What you really need is bread and eggs and fish. But as we grow and mature in our relationship with the Lord, we begin to realize God's ways are so much better, so much higher than my ways. Jesus definitely knows what I really need much more than I do. And, and that's where you walk by faith and not by sight. The parallel passage to what Jesus says here in these verses is in Luke chapter 11. And he goes on to say, Or if you ask for an egg... Will your earthly father give you a scorpion? And then, this is what he says at the end, uh, Luke eleven thirteen. 13. Check this verse out. If you then, being evil, same thing he says here, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, that's a whole other Bible study, but for us as God's children, the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is so much more valuable than any earthly trinket you might be trying to get from God. God's got everything you really need. Now, when it comes to asking God for certain things, don't forget this important fact. Prayer was never intended to be the means by which I get my will done on earth, but prayer is simply the means where... I get what God's will is on earth, even as it is in heaven. Here's a verse that we all need to live by when it comes to praying and asking something from the Lord. 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15. Take note of this. Now, this is the confidence that we have in Him. So He wants us to have confidence in the Lord that if we ask anything... According to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. And so you can pray all you want about that beach house on the island of Kauai that costs $30 million, and you can name it and claim it all you want, but if it's not God's will for you, then let it go. We all need to come to that place where we know and trust God knows what's best. Here's a great quote from Pastor Chuck that deals with this whole issue. He says, I have an agreement with God. If I ask God for anything that is not according to His will, I want Him to just ignore it. <laughs> That's good. Even if I get upset, even if I pout and complain, I may think I know best, but I've discovered that God really knows best. So there's a tremendous confidence that comes when I pray in God's will, submitting my concerns to Him. I mean, that's a qualifier. Not my will, Lord, but Your will be done. If you really believe that He wants the best for you, then you'll understand His will is more important than getting what you want. So verse 12, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. This has become known as the golden rule. Just treat people the same way that you want others to treat you. But again, notice this is in the context of judging other people. In other words, if our judgment of others is not governed by this rule, then we become very puffed up, we become very arrogant, prideful, and we start to become very critical and cynical, and our own hearts will become a place of bitterness and animosity towards others instead of joy and peace. Now we're going to close with the next two verses, but these are very important areas when it comes to judging and Jesus is going to give us another very powerful one after this. Lord willing, we'll see it next time. But this is what he says. Enter by the narrow gate. 
For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. That's Jesus' assessment. He's saying in no uncertain terms that there are only two roads in this world. Both of these roads will lead to eternity. One road leads to eternal separation and damnation away from God. There's only one road that leads to eternal life. One road is broad and wide. It leads to destruction. One road is narrow, the gate is narrow, it leads to life. Now, what is this narrow gate? Who is this? Well, look at John 10, verse 9. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. When I read that, I was like, is that where they got the name in and out Burgers? I bet it is. That's how my mind, I'm sorry. It's lunchtime. We'll go in and out and find pasture. I bet it is. Some of you have to Google that. Anyway, Jesus is the door. Jesus is the narrow gate. He's making it clear. He's making a clear judgment here. The only way a person can be saved is by going through Christ. Coming to Jesus, He's the gate, He's the door. You come through Him. He alone is the way to heaven. That's why the gate is narrow and difficult. You cannot get to heaven by any other means. You cannot get to heaven by being religious or by do, doing a bunch of good works or trying to live up to the Ten Commandments, which is impossible. Well, that sounds like you're being pretty narrow-minded. There's got to be more ways to heaven than through Jesus. I'll bring this up next time. I just, there's a study that just came out. They did a comparison from 2010 to 2000, or 2020. 2010 and 2020. So they, they were um, doing the survey with people 18 to 29 year olds. 2010, 18 to 29 year olds, you know, 2020. One of the statistics was so disturbing. So in 2010, 30%, and these are only people that identified themselves as born again Christians, by the way, from 18 to 29. Back then, 30% said Jesus is not the only way to heaven. That's a lot. 2020, 60% say Jesus isn't the only way to heaven. And it goes into a lot more things. I mean, it's so sad. This is why our nation is in such trouble right now. I don't care if I'm labeled dogmatic, fundamental, narrow-minded person. All I'm saying is what Jesus said. All I'm telling you is what God's Word, the Bible says. Jesus is the only way of salvation. To the religious leaders who opposed Christ, this is what Peter tells them, Acts chapter 4, verse 10. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel. Now, they've been arrested, Peter and John, because uh, they were going up to the temple, and there's a guy there by the beautiful gate, and he's begging for alms. And Peter says, I don't have any silver or gold, no change in my pocket to give you. But what I have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And the guy's instantly healed. And so now they're all mad at Peter and John for doing that. And so they arrest him. So he said, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, who God raised from the dead. There's a gospel right there in a nutshell. By him, Jesus, this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Again, no other name, no other person, no other religion can save you, only Jesus. Jesus said it in no uncertain terms. John 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Period. The world says, well, all roads lead to heaven. There's truth in all religions. You ever hear that? Sorry, but according to the Bible, all roads lead to the great white throne judgment. That's where everyone who has rejected Christ will stand before the great white throne, which is sentencing day. You can read about it in Revelation 20, verses 4 and 5, around that area. 
Everyone who stands before the great white throne will be thrown into the lake of fire that burns forever and ever. That's the wide road that Jesus is speaking of. That's the wide gate that leads to destruction. And even if there's a little truth in all religions, which there is, there are also a lot of lies in every religion. But only Jesus is the truth, the way, the truth. He is truth personified. His word is truth. This is what he prayed. He's praying for you and me in John chapter 17, verse 17. And he says, or sanctify them by your truth. He's praying to the Father. He's saying, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So Jesus doesn't just contain some truth. Jesus is truth. Everything, everything he did, everything he said was truth. This is a simple reason why the world today is in such chaos. This is why the world is so messed up right now, because they've turned away from God's ways, His word, His will, His truth, and they've bought into the lies of the enemy, the ways of the world. Proverbs 14, verse 12. It's also mentioned in Proverbs 16, the exact same verse, but Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way that seems right to a man... Well, you know, I do a lot of good things for people. Surely if there's a God in heaven, he'll have to let me in. <laughs> yeah, there seems, it seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. A lot of roads. Some look good, but without Jesus, it's a dead end, literally. When you study Romans 1, and I encourage you to read Romans 1, verses 18 to the rest of that chapter, it's... We call it the devolution of man. It's a man evolving. It's the devolution of man, where man turns his back on God, and then all these things start to happen because he rejects the Lord. And Paul speaks very clearly about people turning away from God, turning to the wisdom of this world. And Paul tells us um, in the, the Romans 1, verse 24 and 25, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged, this is what we're seeing today throughout the world, who've exchanged the truth of God for the lie. The lie. What is the lie? Remember in the Garden of Eden? That was the lie. Satan told Eve, this fruit won't make you die. No, you'll become just like God. That's the lie. That You don't need God. You can save yourself. You can become a God. You remember Shirley MacLaine years ago wrote that book, Out on a Limb, and she said she was going to become a god, and she stood in the ocean saying, I am God, I am God. And then a wave probably knocked her over, but it's like, how stupid and foolish can you be? Because you exchanged the truth of God for the lie. And here it is, you worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And so this is why we're seeing our country in a free fall right now. As a nation, we don't want Jesus. We say we believe in science. There can be no true science without the omniscient one. That's what science is. Science means knowledge. God is called the omniscient or all-knowing one. You can't have true science without God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And God, who is all-knowing, Again, that's what science means, knew that we would never be able to save ourselves. We could never create a utopia on earth without Jesus. He will establish His kingdom on earth. It'll last for 1,000 years, and that's coming up yeah, at least seven years from now. But God sent Jesus into this sinful world for one purpose— Again, to die on the cross, shed His blood as the only acceptable payment for our sins. The Word of God is clear. There is none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Let me close with this verse, Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. Oh, I worked really hard being a sinner. <laughs> I worked hardly at all that I was a sinner. It came naturally to me. I don't know about you guys. But yeah, that was what I earned is death. But the gift, and it literally means the free gift of God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
How radical is that? You know, we've sinned, we've rebelled, we deserve have, uh, hell. And Jesus comes along and says, I paid the price for your sins. I alone can set you free and forgive you, wash all your sins away, and then bring you into heaven when your life is done. What a deal! And yet Satan has blinded so many people to that reality. And it's only because Jesus rose from the dead that he can offer anybody that free gift of everlasting life. That's why the, the, the way is narrow. That's why the gate is narrow, because only Jesus paid that price to redeem our lives and save our souls. Only Jesus satisfied the wrath of God he became the propitiation, satisfaction of God's wrath for our sins. 1 John 2.2. 2, I told you that last one was the last verse. This will be the last verse. 1 John 2.2. 2. He is a propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but for the sins of the world. He literally died for everybody, but only those that will come to Him by faith will be saved. That's why salvation, Jesus says here, the way is difficult. Why is it difficult? He did everything. It should be easy. It's difficult because it means we have to humble ourselves. We have to say, I can't run my own life. I can't be in control of my own life. I need to surrender my life to Jesus. He alone is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And if I get out of the way and let Him rule and reign in my life, then you'll experience what life is truly all about, with Him in charge and not yourself. 